Welcome to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. Like any good marriage, we will debate, evaluate, and sometimes quarrel about how privacy and security impact business in the 21st century. Hi, Jody Daniels here. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Clover Advisors, a certified women's privacy consultancy. I'm a privacy consultant and certified informational privacy professional providing practical privacy advice to overwhelmed companies. Hello, Justin Daniels here. I am passionate about helping companies solve complex cyber and privacy challenges during the life cycle of their business. I am the cyber quarterback helping clients design and implement cyber plans as well as help them manage and recover from data breaches. And this episode is brought to you by... That was a really long, quiet (laughs) drumroll. Red Clover Advisors. We help companies to comply with data privacy laws and establish customer trust so that they can grow and nurture integrity. We work with companies in a variety of fields, including technology, SaaS, e-commerce, media, and professional services. In short, we use data privacy to transform the way companies do business. Together, we're creating a future where there's greater trust between companies and consumers. To learn more, visit redcloveradvisors.com. I feel transformed today in dog hair. Well, we we do have uh, Basil, the, the dog and chief guest on our podcast, who is going through some kind of crazy shedding season. So we are we are totally ensconced in, in dog hair. If you can see us on the video here, it's much fun. Whoa, ensconced. Wow, Impressive. Fancy Big words for Tuesday. <laughs> well, let's introduce our guest. Yes, I'm so excited to introduce Justin Payer, who is a cyber safety specialist and also a dad. And after more than a decade in K-12 enterprise sales leadership, Justin co-founded National Education Technologies with a passion of helping parents teach their kids a balanced and safe approach to using mobile technology. Battling the constant love-hate relationship with technology, Justin is a dad of two teens and leads product vision for digital well-being mobile apps, Boomerang Parental Control, and Spin Safe Browser. Well, Justin, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for reaching out. Looking forward to this. We might have to change the name of the show today to be the um, Double Justin Show. Well, I want to ask, Justin, how often do you get called Jason? Actually, you know what? Surprisingly, on and off, probably two times out of 10. Not sure about you. For me, it's usually around six or seven. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) <laughs> I find it depends on the audience. If it's more of an international audience, they'll do Jason. Uh, locally, I, I get Jason once in a while, but it depends who I'm talking to is what I know. It's, yeah, I sometimes get Justine as well, which yep. is an interesting <laughs> one. So they, add, they add the silent E at the end, so go figure. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. Okay. I guess, yeah. yeah. All right, well, <laughs> kick us off, uh, Justine. <laughs> Justine. <laughs> Today, you'll be Justin and I'll be Justine. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, so, Justin, uh, let's begin from the beginning. How did your career path take you to your current role? Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, kind of those intersection points in life that happened, right? So I was a sales leader into a company for about 13 years, um, exited that, and then, you know, been there for that many years, you're kind of like, okay, what's next? And, you know, sacrifice many years of time away from the family at that time. And my kids were just starting to become teens um, and their introduction to technology, mobile app uh, devices. And uh, me and my business partner, who we ended up co-founding National EdTech, we were good mentors and friends to each other. So we said, hey, let's just co-found a company and so-called stay in the game and maybe resell a few education products for now. And maybe eventually we own our own IP, right? Our own intellectual property. I'm like, okay, sure. Why not? Let's do that. So started that with National EdTech about six months after my uh, 13 years of being a sales leader. And it was okay. It wasn't great, but it was nice. I was at home where I was able to take the kids to school or to the activities. So I had that kind of work-life integration being figured out. And I'm like, I'm not missing traveling downtown anymore, which was great. Um, but fu- funny enough is seven months roughly into that um, adventure, we got introduced to a local entrepreneur who had built this platform and was actually reaching out mostly to do uh, an introduction to it for enterprise uh, platform. So it was a mobile device platform. So pretty much to be able to manage Android and iOS devices remotely, which is kind of like a standard now. Seven years ago, we're still building. But when we found, when we saw the demo, we're like, 
can this be used for like, you know, like kid devices? It's like, oh yeah, I got something for that. Pulls up a mock-up, gives us a demo of this parental control platform. We're like, well, that's what we want. So that's how it all started was that introduction to the local entrepreneur who had originally built the platform for his own autistic child or son because he wanted time limits on his Android tablet. So being an engineer, he built an app. Then he's like, hey, a bunch of friends saw it. They're like, well, this would be kind of cool for my kid too. Can you just put it on the, on the Play Store, the App Store? It's like, sure. So before you know it, a couple years of that, and you're getting iterations of features and all that stuff. So that's how you know this all started, is the beginning of our actual parental control, I guess, adventure that we're on now. So it wasn't called Boomerang at the time. Guys, uh, looking at you know the competition, the market, the challenges, the benefits, you know, the problems that we're trying to fix. Um, and Boomerang came up uh, as a term because the idea of a boomerang action, right? So you throw out a boomerang, comes back to you. So with the child device, we're kind of doing the same thing. So you put our app on your child device, some information will come back to you, like installed apps and tracking location, all that. So it really uh, ran well that way from a branding standpoint. And then we also felt there was a gap in parental controls at that time. There was no safe browsing that was kind of as a suite. So we also added a safe browser and we ended up calling it Spin. So kind of working with the boomerang action. So the two together or independent were quite fine. So that's how we got started in this whole adventure we're on now. Yeah, seven years later. Crazy. Well, congratulations. It's always really fun to hear various entrepreneur stories. Uh, can you share a little bit more about what these different apps are actually doing? Sure. So I'll start with the safe browsing one. So what we've done is we've, we've created a fully contained browser. Um, it's based on Mozilla, so it's not like it's a, a homemade browser. It's a secure browser with Mozilla as a backing. But we've customized it to have a built-in web filter. And that is both for iOS and Android devices. And what it pretty much does is anywhere you take the device now with our browser, it will filter out nudity, pornography. We even have a category we call prone to bad content, which is actually kind of curated from our, our community of users. And why I speak about this browser first, because our community of users is not just kids. There's actually a lot of adult users on our browser today. I'd say the majority of them are actually adult users that actually suffer with the mental health around pornography addiction and those kinds of uh, challenges. So they use our browsers as their daily main default browser on their devices. Um, so of course, they're always trying to find ways around the filters, which, you know, no filter is perfect. So we get this, you know, great feedback every day of, yeah, this one wasn't blocked, this one was overblocked. And I think that makes us quite unique on blocking this kind of content today versus the big boys that just use machines pretty much. We use machines as well, but I think our, our community of users makes us quite unique. So that's the browsing aspect, which is, you know, ties really well to online safety, keeping kids safe when they browse the internet. It also enforces like Google safe search. So if you're Googling, it's going to give you the strict results that Google provides. Not perfect, but way better, like no nudity as an example, <laughs> which is good. And then um, the other app is a separate app. It's Boomerang Parental Control. So that's kind of, you know, the popular terminology of screen time, you know, app controls, location tracking. Um, on iOS, we do a lot less than Android because of the limitations that Apple provides us. So we've had a few fights on that over the years um, with, you know, Apple's changes of rules and making it harder for us to compete there ever since they released their own version. Google's been okay, but I still see some potential similarities there. But um, that's the boomerang parental control side where we allow, you know, full remote control from the parent's device as well. So the cool thing is, even if it's an iOS device uh, for the child or Android, the parent can have either or and can still get the same control. So that's one thing we worked on as well uh, from that. And they can also use our web dashboard. So if, they don't, if the parent does not want to install our app on their phone, they can just use our website and they can control their kids' devices that way as well. And can you also add any, inf uh, let's say there's a particular site that you don't want a child to go to. Can you mm -hmm. kind of be specific and say, I don't want them to go to this site? Yeah, so we have a course of categories that cannot be turned off, right? Like nudity, pornography, you're not turning that off. Um, I think we have about six or seven, but absolutely. So, if, so as a parent, and this goes back to parenting styles, right? We may talk about this later, but um, all depending on your style and your beliefs and what kind of data and content your kids want to see or you want them to see, you can go absolutely ahead and block specific domains that you don't want your kids to you know, navigate independent of our categories. So that's definitely flexible that way. You're looking at me. Yes. <laughs> well, kind of more generally, um, how can parents think differently when it comes to the screen time battle? Because we have that every single day in our house, <laughs> and it 
it's an important debate, but it also impacts the relationship we have with our child. And I don't know that we're ever finding the right way to do it. It seems challenging. Yeah. Well, I think you nailed it. It is a challenge. Um, and all depending when you start this, you know, a, you know, conversation with your child about giving them their first tech or piece of technology. Um, you know, for me, when it comes down to thinking different, I think we actually are thinking quite differently about it since COVID, to be frank. Um, because kind of screen time rules were kind of thrown out the door because we're all spending so much more time on our screens. Let's just be frank. Um, but one thing I do like to think about screen time as a term, because it got a really bad label before COVID. It can continues to have a lot of kind of negative press around screen time. I do believe nowadays there is such thing as good screen time. And, and it comes down to the content that the kids are spending time on. So we know that schools are you know, embracing technology. There's way more time in front of a glowing screen at school. Uh, they're, they're using iPads, they're using Chromebooks, they're using all these devices that now online platforms are educating kids this way. So I do believe screen time that way is actually not bad because that's how they're learning now. Where it becomes more differently is, is for parents that it's not all bad. If I was to summarize kind of like my two cents around screen time is it's typically viewed as a bad thing. Too much screen time is bad. Well, it depends what you do with it, right? And I think don't assume that everything your child doing on their device is bad. In fact, in many cases, they're probably doing research on something topic they have an interest in. Um, and they're using social media to access that content or whatever. So, you know, I've, I've gone through that kind of negative approach, you know, instantly go to negative first versus thinking about the bigger picture and say, maybe there's something good here. And I use that kind of to kind of start conversations with my own kids. I mean, my kids are older now, they're late teens. So when I started this, they were early teens. Um, so, and I think that's helped because now we can joke around. So, hey, spending so much time on Instagram, what's happening? Right. Versus, oh, turn off that phone. You're always on Instagram, I'm taking it away. Totally different aspect. So you're showing interest in their screen time use uh, versus trying to lock it down. So I'm not sure if that works for every family, but that has helped me get through some of that. And again, I'm not perfect as a parent, neither. I've had my challenges. Um, but I think using, you know, even if you're not using a kind of a limitation on screen time and all that, having conversation about how much time you're spending, but also what are you spending time on? What's interesting on there? keeping it open so you have a dialogue with your child. I think starting conversations is probably step one around screen time. In that vein on social media, what, you know, there are some pluses to social media and there's, there's obviously some downsides to social media. So mm -hmm. I'm curious for your thoughts as to how you think social media has changed how we relate to our kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one because uh, social media, I think has a lot of positives. I mean, we can communicate so much I'd say better, so more instant, uh, you know, in, it's the content, you know, information age we are in, it's kind of nice to have that, but it has a lot of negatives as well, because social media platforms are, are not free, even though they're free to sign up and use, uh, you know, the cost is our time, the cost is the data we mine on there. And these rabbit holes they've created for us is definitely challenging and dangerous for, for a lot of us, not just kids, but adults as well. So I think from a social media standpoint, you know, it's changed how we spend time together, number one, right? You know, we're not necessarily in front of our faces chatting at the table. A lot of tables now have phones on and we're still checking our, 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 our walls or profiles and checking likes and checking comments. So I think that's been one big change I've seen. Um, you still see that at restaurants. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, well, that's a challenge, right? It's, kind of, it's almost sad, actually, because, you know, as there's more pressure from technology people, technology companies that want to keep pushing this technology first mentality, I think as humans, we're losing some of those basics that we used to have. Um, so I think social media is a big part of that. We call it social media, but it's not as social as we think it is, you know, in my opinion. I think it's got a lot more, you know, you're not building those skills, especially with younger kids around talking to people, having, you know, to give you an example, my kids prefer to text. I pick up the phone and call them back. You're like, why are you calling me? Because I don't want to text anymore. <laughs> I want to just have a quick chat for five minutes. I'll be way more productive than having a chat to say this via text message. So I think that's one, ex a few examples of how things have changed with social media and, you know, smartphones in general. You know, it's funny you say that because I was having a conversation with my wife and having both of our cars send the message instead of just picking up the phone <laughs> on the car and so, just calling her. I was so Here thinking we go. the exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so this is not a unique problem to just you or us. It's a worldwide problem. I mean, it doesn't matter what language you speak, what background you have. This is how we, the behavior that's been built is exactly that. And it's crazy to think that's, you know, we prefer to send a text and pick up the phone to talk to each other and hear our voices. Like that to me is just, you know, maybe it's because I'm getting older and realizing I went through this whole rabbit hole myself in my business. 
know, we've, we've seen customers of ours, users of ours that had real challenges at home and be able to kind of learn from that and say, I can better myself and my own family and my own approach myself. Maybe that's why I'm, I am where I am. But yeah, it's, it's so true. <laughs> you nailed it. Like, why are we doing this to ourselves? <laughs> can you share a little bit more about what you just said, where you, it sounded like there were some customers, they were going through some mm-hmm. interesting challenges and maybe they kind of turned a corner. Can you share a little bit more about what, what they yeah. shared was successful? I mean, most of our customers come to us for, you know, screen time management, location tracking, you know, and that usually works fine for them. But there is a subset of our users that have a pretty extreme need when they come into our platform. Um, and I'll just speak about the limitations of our platform today on iOS. iOS does not allow us to do the following, which we can do on Android. So one thing that was very popular and still is on and off is monitoring of keywords and text messages. So on, on an Android device, we can detect that. The challenge with Android now is they're becoming more and more encrypted. So we're actually having a harder time to do that consistently on all devices now. So just being upfront about that with you guys, but for most devices, we're still able to to pick that up. So one scenario we've had a lot is there were some cyberbullying examples uh, or bad language examples that were sent to a child. And our app was able to detect that, inform the parent, and the parent could start a conversation with the child about, hey, what's going on? And because we're also grabbing the the contact info, if the child had that, that, you know, that other kid's contact info on their phone, we'd be able to tell that, hey, little Johnny is sending some bad messages to my child. We can deal with that parent separately offline. So that was one example. We had a, you know, more than one, but a cyberbullying scenario where uh, detect- detection of keywords. And these keywords were customizable by the parent, um, right? And to be somewhat you know, cheeky about it for one second, we even had parents, moms especially, were putting the boyfriend's name in there. <laughs> So when the boyfriend's name came up in a text and she would get notified. So there were some cool scenarios there, but there's also some serious ones where, you know, um, even calling, right? So someone's like uh, aggressively calling somebody. So we were able to block the call. So our app allows to block calls based on a number or based on only allowing calls from the contacts inside the, the phone's contact. So again, only on Android, we can do this. So those are some of the scenarios we had. We cannot monitor social media. So we only can only monitor time spent and block the app completely, which is also sometimes a good thing. For your parents know it's an issue with their kids' social media use, they can simply block the individual apps and you're good to go. But uh, most of our kind of like issues have been around kind of three things. The calling features on our Android features, uh, the texting, monitoring of uh, keywords, and of course our safe browser, which you know we've had, um, this is kind of sad actually, even locally we had a, a local, um, a sex education specialist that mentioned to me in, with a couple of events we did a few years ago that, you know, kids as young as, you know, grade six, grade five have been seen to be addicted to pornography already because they've seen it, right? They saw the rabbit hole. They might've seen a bad image once and then they go in and they, well, let's see if this happens again, if I search that same term. And before you know it, they're tapping down two, three images and they're down this unfiltered view of things. So our safe browser is also an area that parents were really in, you know, interested in using our platform for. So few examples for you. Um, when it comes to the safe browser, what are some of the challenges that parents might not be aware of that they should be? Okay. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, when you give your child their first smartphone or tablet, right, Android or iOS, um, I mean, Safari and Chrome are not filtered. Like they're, you know, unfiltered browsers from the, from the get-go. Now they've gotten better. They do have family features that are better than it used to be but they're not always enabled by the parents. In fact, I'm surprised how many parents still don't know that iOS has screen time features. <laughs> it's just one of those things, right? So in terms of the browsers, there's a few other things. So by default, Google does not enforce any filtering in their searches. So if you put kitty cats in images in an elementary school, you're not filtering images in uh, Google, you may end up with some nasty or you know, flavorful stuff on there that maybe you don't want like a grade two child to see. So in our case, our safe browser enforces the strictest mode of Google safe search, so that those are as filtered as best as they get from the Google side. Um, and beyond that, we have our six or seven categories that we blog by default. Like we talked about, so pornography, nudity, proxy VPN websites. So they can't use those websites to see other websites, for example. Uh, we also blog thousands of unsafe search engines. So ones that have been curated from our own users, some of we have found ourselves, where if we cannot enforce them with a strict search, we block them. So that's another area that we block automatically. And these categories cannot be turned off by the user. So that's, you know, from a browser standpoint, I think that's a big one. And usually most parents I talk to don't realize that there's no actual filter on the device. Now I'll add one more thing. 
a lot of home routers have become smarter now and they do offer web filtering when, when you're at home, which is great. I mean, I think that's a long time coming and they're also a lot easier to use now. The challenge is when you go to the Starbucks or go to grandma's, that router is not there anymore doing the filtering. So that's why I go back to having the browser filtered like we do. It doesn't care what network it's on. So that's a benefit there. Well, thank you for sharing. I think you're right. I think there's a lot of parents who are very unfamiliar with some of the risks that are out there. And it's exactly why we want to be able to help feature uh, people like you who are helping to make it safer for our children. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a good point. Thank you. <laughs> so what are some things parents can do now to better manage technology and their relationship with their kids? Like our daughter said she wanted to be on TikTok like all of her other yeah. friends. And sadly for her with a parents who are in both the privacy and security industry, that didn't go anywhere. And she was yeah. not happy with us for multiple weeks. She's still not happy with us. <laughs> no, multiple We're months, the but... only parents <laughs> who won't let her have a phone. We're the only parents. Yeah. Now she does have a device, but it is not okay. a portable one that gets to go everywhere with her. So and she's we're not, still not we'll, popular. We offered her the flip phone, but that was rejected out of hand as we knew it would be because it's an uncool looking phone. Well, the new flip phones are pretty nice. They're like a smartphone. That's probably not the kind of flip phone we're talking about here. No, no. We were thinking a little bit more of the old ancient we're kind. We thinking <laughs> circa 2002. Yeah. Nokia special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll go back to what I said earlier when we first started. I think number one is starting conversations. So explaining your side of the story, why you, you want to allow them or not to do something on technology. Now, unfortunately today, you can't say the whole, you know, if uh, Betty wants to jump off the bridge and go ahead, you can't do that anymore. Just because they're like, yeah, I'll jump off the bridge because they're pushing back, right? Back nowadays, they want to follow. Um, it's a definite challenge to push back on what your, your friends are doing, right? I mean, I fought that as well. And then the kids get their first device and they can create those accounts freely without the parent really knowing. So that's a definite challenge. So good on you for not you know, breaking that down yet. Um, you know, my business partner actually did something pretty cool with his kids. He's got three kids. Um, and he just recently removed the limits on his youngest. And she's, I think, 14 or 15 now. But what he did is he still kept the product on, but with all really wide open limits. And what he saw was she used up all the time. So it just continued to kind of just cascade into more and more time. So, you know, to go back to the main question, like what can parents do? Like I said, number one, you need to talk about it. Number two, I think parents need to educate themselves a bit better on what's out there. I think that's a big gap that we keep to continue to see. Uh, you expect our app to do everything. It's not going to replace you as a parent. Sorry. It's going to help. It's going to give you nudges. It's going to help you start conversations, but it's not going to, you know, fix all your problems around technology, right? Can't um, outsource my parenting duties to your no, technology. No, man, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, I'd be a lot bigger business if I could, trust me. <laughs> um, so, you know, the story, I put a couple of notes here. I just want to go back to what I put here is, you know, you're, you're, you're in your example, uh, Jody and Justin, you're at a point where you haven't even introduced that first smartphone. <clears throat> and that's where you have an opportunity to really set those limits. And it doesn't have to necessarily be like hard limits around technology per se, but around behavior. Um, so I think that's number one. If you're a parent right now that's you know looking to buy the first smartphone for your child's birthday or upcoming uh, back to school, you know, look at things like you know, the connection of your internet, can it be filtered at home? You know, that's one thing to look into. Um, you know, are you okay with your kids installing Instagram and TikTok, and Snapchat? And are you aware of the stuff that's on there that's not filtered, right? There's not a lot of ways to filter that content. It's a wide open you know, kind of a you know, platform that you can't really do much about. They're, though they're introducing things, parents have to educate themselves on how to do that. And you can't log them down. So it's a very, very difficult thing uh, around that. Um, I would say, if anything, is a few more tips around this is don't let technology go in the bedroom. That's a big one that I found that got parents into trouble with their kids is that the overuse kids don't sleep well anymore. The device is on all night. They're chatting at night. Um, then everything cascades from there around school and sleep schedule and moodiness and all that. I mean, that's one we've seen. Uh, as soon as you use our app and you set a schedule, you know, 8 p.m. after 8 p.m., our, our device is locked and you can only access good apps. That kind of deters you from going to your social media, doesn't it? So that's, that's one example of using apps properly in a fine balance. Like, I wouldn't go in and lock everything like hard. I would graduate the, the child, right? You know, maybe you get a few hours a day and I take the device away to start. Earn it. 
right? That could be one way of, of doing it. But again, it's tough. Like you said, Justin, like, oh, my, my, my daughter's kids, uh, friends have TikTok. She wants it too. It's definitely, definitely tough. And you're probably not the cool parent right now by pushing back on that. And uncool, but she's <laughs> less cool than I am. Ha, ha, ha. You're so kind. Uh, what would you say, we always ask every guest, and you've shared so many yeah. wonderful tips. Mm. Is there uh, a certain, given what you know in the privacy mm. and security space, and kind of aside from the app and browser, is there a, a privacy or security tip that you would offer to help, uh, to help parents? That's a, that's a really good question. I kind of shared a bit of what I was going to answer already, but let me just think about kind of a general what I would do. I mean, security tips and child privacy. I mean, one thing is, um, you know, sharing credentials. I know a lot of kids would share credentials. I'll give you an example. Snapchat. I got to keep my streaks going. That's a real use case for kids, right? I got to keep my, my, my streak going. So I remember my kids actually sharing their Snapchat credential to each other so password to get into their app so they could keep snapping somebody else's you know, friends list so they could keep the streaks going. Now, once you're in someone's account, guess what? You could be malicious. You could send nasty messages or delete things or whatever. So I think that would be one thing is that, you know, treat your password or your account information private, just like you would say your phone number or your home address. Um, you know, we don't go out, you know, doing that out and sharing that information freely. Um, so that would be one thing if you're looking at a specific one on, say, on Snapchat, which is still, still very popular. Um, another tip I'd say, which is maybe more for parents, is you know taking pictures of their kids with things like their home address in the background. Right, back to school is a big, big time. Right, we see that where you're snapping pictures of the kids on the front porch and you got your address in the background. And you're putting that on Facebook. Well, that image is being mined now for information. Yeah, those Both are location, right? So. I mean, those are just a couple of things. There's a, there's an endless list of like scenarios, but you know, there's a probably a couple of areas that could probably relate to a lot of people. We've all done it. So I'm only saying this because I've done it too. Okay. So there's no, uh, there's no blame or, or pointing fingers. Um, you, we learn from this. And you know, the, the last one I would say is, you know, these social media platforms are not there for your well being, right? It, which means they're not there for the well being of our kids. They're not there for the well being of us. They're there to make a profit and they're making a profit off what we put in them. So everything they do is all about engaging us to get back into the app. Think about a like no notification. Think about, hey, you haven't been on Snapchat for a while. Your friends are online, right? Uh, I, I pick on the Snapchat because my kids use it a lot. So I've seen some of the stuff they do. You know, when someone starts to type, you get a notification. So in advance of them sending you a message, you already know they're good about to send you a message. Like, think about all that kind of behavior. Like before, you'd be surprised getting a message or someone calls you at the home phone, right? Who has a home phone nowadays anyway, but... <laughs> So I think there's a lot there because it's, we could talk for hours about tips and online safety, but I think around social media, because that's the big topic that a lot of parents struggle with their kids, including yours, which you haven't done yet, but you're struggling with the introduction. I want it, I want it, but I'm not ready for you to have it. You know, do your education on it. It's not a, as great place as it seems. Um, you know, I've seen nieces get into content that they shouldn't have seen before. And that was on TikTok. You know, some of the dances they show there. I mean, I'm sorry, that's not really appropriate for a 10-year-old to see. Right. And she's mimicking it, not knowing what it means. Right. So that's the kind of stuff I've seen. Right. It's not cool. Those are really yeah. wonderful tips. Thank you for going above yeah. and beyond and sharing three. Well, there we go. It's a hat trick. Very French Canadian hockey like. <laughs> <laughs> Just remember, Jerry, in this show, we didn't touch on what happens to kids when we start down the route of the metaverse, because that's where things are heading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's being pushed on our throats right now. And I'm not a fan of it. You know, and you see that across everything, right? Think about the fitness platforms, right? The Pelotons and all that. Like, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a big cyclist, which kind of goes into, I think, you know, what I like to do for fun, right? Um, I'm a big cyclist. Um, I, get to get, I get to go outside, get some fresh air. I'm inside all the time working. So for me to have to be there on a, on a spinning wheel like a, like a hamster with a, a glowing screen in front of me with this virtual world, uh, it's just that, just that behavior we're building. And I know guys are addicted to that. Like they go on there every day, they got to get their fitness up. I'm like, no, it's not the fitness part. It's the fact you see the numbers and you're seeing the likes and you're seeing all the progress. It's all the behavior. They've nailed the behavior that we like, the dopamine hits that we get from achievements and all that stuff. So there we go. That yeah. was one thing I want to add to that. Well, since you've given us insight into what you like to do for fun, yeah. um, 
I like to cycle as well. I'd love to hear more about what you like about being outside and riding the bike versus the Peloton, because it sounds like you do both. I don't have a Peloton, so I'll be clear about that, but I do have okay. a virtual trainer. So I have a, it is the same thing at the end of the day. Um, so outside is, you know, number one is, I think in the last couple of years, I've definitely taken more to the gravel riding type of riding. So off the beaten path, off the traffic, in the woods, especially here where I am in Vancouver, BC, there's so many amazing trails and away from traffic and peace and quiet in the mountains and, you know, endless logging roads, right? Endless gravel logging roads. So I enjoy that uh, more so than even road riding. So those are two types of cycling I do. But why I enjoy it is number one, is my, that's pretty much my social network now. Like the buddies I ride with, they're like my buddies, like from social network. Right? It's not from work. So I'm working from home. Um, you know, you don't have, I don't spend much time on social media to make friends that way. So I think cycling for me is more than just cycling. It's a bit of a community for me. So that's kind of why I do it. And looking forward to doing it again. But here in Vancouver, it's tough in the winter. It rains a lot. <laughs> so, it's beautiful know. there. We absolutely love it. And uh, I do have a Peloton, but it's interesting. I don't want any part of the community piece. I don't do mm. any of it. I just, yeah. I like the ability to, I don't, to ride right here. And then mm -hmm. I ignore all the other parts. So the high-fiving and the leaderboard, I just... Yeah, it's too like over the top for me. It feels fake. Yeah, it's too much for me. I don't know. I mean, I, I suffer enough by myself. I don't need someone else to tell me to suffer more <laughs> when I'm on a bike. I don't mind the motivation <laughs> part, but I don't need all the yeah. other I don't need all the other pieces. Yeah. I think there's oh, like two gotcha. people who follow me. Um, I'm one of them. I, <laughs> you're one of them. <laughs> it's okay. Mm, yeah, it's well, Justin, good. this has been fabulous. Where can people yeah. learn more uh, and to connect with you? Great. So, I mean, uh, the parental control platform is uh, available on our website. So if you go to useboomerang.com, uh, you'll get all the information about our parental control features there. Our safe browser is also listed on there. So I'll give you an idea on that. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, I actually, I think I'm on the, the Teams page as well on our website. So you can find me there. On LinkedIn, it's just JP underscore payer, my last name. Um, so you know, I try to post about this kind of content on a weekly, somewhat daily basis, but it depends. I try not to go too crazy on social media myself to somewhat lead by example, but as you know, go through ups and downs on that as well. <laughs> right. Well, here you're helping to educate us so we all stay safe. So you get a pass. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Justin, thank you again so much. We really enjoyed it. Well, thanks for the opportunity to chat with you guys and share tips with uh, you know, your audience. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for listening to the She Said Privacy, He Said Security podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check us out on LinkedIn. See you next time. Bye.